part two of the lecture on radiologic anatomy of the skull base. It'll make a lot more sense if you've seen part one already. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the central skull base and see if we can identify all the different foramina that are present on this image. We'll start here. As advertised, the foramen ovale, when you cut it in cross-section, is oval, right? If we look at foramen ovale in a different projection, it doesn't look so oval anymore, but this is another classic coronal image where you can see the orientation of foramen ovale out laterally. It's sending the mandibular nerve out laterally and so that it can go through the mandibular foramen. Oh, right there, the for mandibular foramen and out as the inferior alveolar nerve. So that, that diagonal orientation of foramen ovale, absolutely classic. Okay, back to this picture. If that was foramen ovale, this is foramen spinosum, which carries the middle meningeal artery up to the inner table of the skull. These pair, the foramen ovale plus foramen spinosum, has been likened to the imprint of a high-heeled shoe. So if you can find that footprint, then you can orient yourself to ovale and spinosum. This is the carotid foramen. It's going to lead into the carotid canal, which will run at about 45 degrees like so. Oh, here it is on the other side. You can see its orientation. It'll run just like this on the next cut up. Right behind the carotid foramen is the jugular bulb. It's quite variable in size. Um, and it carries not only the jugular vein, the internal jugular vein, but also uh, lower cranial nerves are running through here. Here's foramen rotundum, right where we were talking about it before, uh, running as a short distance along the anterior skull base. Just in front of that is the inferior orbital fissure, just like we were talking about on previous images. What about this triangular foramen right here? This is foramen lacerum. What goes through foramen lacerum just lateral to the clivus here? Well, not much. A few sympathetic branches and a few small vessels. No large structures go through foramen lacerum. So why is it important? Well, for one thing, it lies just below the carotid canal. And so uh, abnormalities of the carotid can affect foramen lacerum. Also, this can be a path of spread, both for tumor and especially for infection. If you have an infection spreading across the inferior aspect of the skull base, it can encroach upon the intracranial vault through foramen lacerum. Here's that picture of the clivus again. It's this triangular bone, at least on sagittal projection, a triangular bone that forms the central skull base in the midline. Axial image, it perhaps looks a bit more rectangular. You know, if you look carefully, you can still see the fusion plane in the mid clivus in this young patient. In children, this is an obvious gap between the upper and lower clivus, and that's totally normal. This one's sort of partially fused, also normal. Forming the lateral aspect of the lower clivus is the hypoglossal canal. It always has nice, well-corticated margins on either side, and it's, of course, carrying the hypoglossal nerve, the 12th cranial nerve, as well as the hypoglossal artery coming the other direction. Here's what it looks like on a T2-weighted image. You can actually see the hypoglossal nerve going right into the hypoglossal canal there on high-resolution T2-weighted sequences. And on enhanced sequences, again, you can see the nerve just going right through the canal, and you can see how much venous and arterial structures are accompanying the nerve. Very vascular area for that nerve to run through as it goes through the hypoglossal canal. Totally normal. Totally normal to have that much enhancement within the hypoglossal canal. It's useful. Well, here's one way it's useful. Notice that half of this patient's tongue has too much fat. This is the appropriate amount of fat and muscle marbled in the tongue, and this half of the tongue is mostly fat. That's because this is undergoing denervation atrophy. The hypoglossal nerve, which is responsible for the muscles of the tongue, has been injured. These muscles are no longer being stimulated, and you get fatty 
atrophy of this half of the tongue. So when you see this, where should you look next? The bottleneck of the course of the hypoglossal nerve is the hypoglossal canal. That's where you're usually going to uh, get pathology injuring the nerve. And here it is. This is a low-grade chondrosarcoma that is impinging upon the hypoglossal canal, causing that denervation atrophy. Another canal that's really important relative to the clivus is Dorello's canal. This is the fibrous sheath through which the sixth cranial nerve runs. Remember, the sixth cranial nerve comes from the pontomedullary junction, crosses the prepontine cistern, dives into Dorello's canal, runs up the back of the clivus where it is exposed to any clival pathology, any mass or infection in the clivus can affect the sixth cranial nerve as it runs up through Dorello's canal along the back of the clivus. Another important anatomic relationship for the clivus is the petroclival synchondrosis. This is the clivus, this is the petrous portion of the temporal bone, and this line between them which has variable width. Sometimes it's nice and wide, like in this patient's. Sometimes it's just a very narrow little line. Sometimes it's essentially not appreciable on CT. But in this location is the petroclival synchondrosis. Uh, this is obviously famous as a site for chondrosarcomas to arise in the skull base. And now the occipital condyles. We've gotten to the back of the skull base. The occipital condyles are the portion of the skull base that articulate with the cervical spine. And uh, these are the articulation points between the first cervical vertebra and the skull base. Those are the occipital condyles. Here they are as seen in axial plane, as sort of elongated ovals connecting in the center, the occipital condyle. But what's this? You'll frequently see veins running through the region of the posterior skull base, and they're variable. Sometimes they'll be there, sometimes they aren't, they'll be variable in size. When you see them around the occipital condyle, these are called condylar emissary veins, and almost everybody's got some form of condylar emissary veins, whether they're posterior, lateral, or anterior condylar emissary veins. These are not to be confused with occipital emissary veins, which that's an inconstant vein that runs through the skull in the midline in the, in the back, or an occipital vein, which is a continuation of the superior sagittal sinus inside the cranial vault in the midline of the posterior fossa, or a mastoid emissary vein, which is out here, as you'd expect, near the mastoids more laterally. So there are names for all of these extra veins or inconstant veins that traverse the posterior skull base, but the most common of them is the condylar emissary vein. If you're more interested in that, you can see Dr. Escott's excellent radiographics article from about a decade ago on uh, veins of the head and neck. That concludes our review of the radiologic anatomy of the skull base. Hopefully this will serve as a foundation for learning more about the pathology that affects this region.